In this episode of Fictional Hangover, we talk about hysterical females, scoffing at boys' clothes, stabbing creepy shopkeepers, and stealing your brother's dress. In our discussion of The Case of the Left-Handed Lady, an Enola Holmes mystery by Nancy Springer. everybody, welcome to Fictional Hangover, a podcast about young adult and new adult books, series, authors, and voice actors that is full of spoilers. I'm Amanda. And I'm Claire. And today we're going to discuss the case of the left-handed lady and Enola Holmes mystery by Nancy Springer. Standard disclaimer. If you haven't read this book, please remember that Fictional Hangover is all about spoilers. If you haven't read or listened and don't want to be spoiled, stop listening to us and go read or listen to the book. Then come back. If you haven't done this but want to pretend that you have, or if you don't care about spoilers, or if you just like the show so much that you don't care about any of that, then listen up. Marvelous. Was that too much? Was that over the top? No, it's probably put on point, really, for for this podcast. Yeah, okay. (laughs) If anything, it's not dramatic enough. You're right. We like drama. Drama. (laughs) Standard disclaimer. Once in a world far, far ago. (laughs) There were spoilers left. There were spoilers right. In the movie, in the audiobook, on the TV. (laughs) But then, along came a podcast. <laughs> and they ruined now. everything for everyone. everyone. They were lovable assholes. <laughs> the both of them. But they had magnificent hair. <laughs> <laughs> what is happening right now? It's been a long day. It's Nay, been a, a long, long week. Day. <laughs> yes, it has. It has been. I agree. <laughs> Let's just move on to background information and just get over this. It's probably for the best. So I found some background information on sffworld.com. This is a little article written in June of 2015. Mm. It's an interview with Nancy Springer. And the interviewee says, I think it's safe to say that you've brought a different perspective on women into this universe. How has it been to expand on something that was written in such a different time and age? And Nancy Springer's response is, simply because Conan Doyle was such a misogynist and the super intelligent Sherlock Holmes so clueless about women, it was a delight. (laughs) The more I researched the ridiculous restraints that were imposed on girls and women in the Victorian era, the more I discovered a subculture of clever women inventing ingenious ways to flout the proprieties, and because Sherlock was such a confirmed bachelor, because he so assiduously avoided female contact, Enola could blindside him time after time. I'm surprised nobody else took advantage of this story angle before I did. I like that he's a confirmed bachelor. (laughs) Not at all homosexual or asexual. Confirmed bachelor. Does make him what, sound sexy. What he did with Dr. John Watson before Dr. John Watson got married is up to them. As long as it was consensual. That's right. They're consensually solving mysteries. <laughs> sexy <laughs> mysteries. Well, I think I might have to change my recommendation for this week. <laughs> Ooh. I'm just going to Google sexy Sherlock Holmes mysteries. <laughs> <laughs> I think that we should do that. We're just gonna hypersexualize this episode of the podcast. We have latched all already. <laughs> I'm just gonna it's read best. my parts of the summary like this. Mm. <laughs> this nice. book about a 13 or 14 year old girl. <laughs> Would I gotta you, would stop you like an example of one already? Just the title. I don't yes. have to go into it. It's yes. um, Compound a Felony. Oh. A Queer Affair of Sherlock Holmes. Ooh. Nice. Kissing Sherlock Holmes. 
oh my god, there's a website with just 120 sexy Sherlock Holmes ideas. Please. Well, it was there. It was. We knew it was. We knew it was. Please share that with everyone after this episode comes out. Can you just like schedule a post on social media so we don't forget to do it? I think I'll have to. I think you will. <laughs> all right. Anyway, for the love of all that is holy. Initial thought: It wasn't sexy enough because it's about a fourteen-year-old girl, and that's appropriate. Ah, <laughs> uh, yep. Uh, my genuine, honest to God, in- initial thought is: It makes my little heart happy that this is actually episode two two one. If only it was two two one B. Well, unless Nancy Springer was going to come on, it's not going to have a two two one B. Ah, oh, man. No. But it's it, still, it, it just it it's poetic, I like it. It really is. It's it's kind of amazing that it happened this way. <laughs> Not even planned. This isn't one of those nice no. things that we plan. It no. just happened. It just happened and it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. London, January 1889. A younger, taller, black egret of a man is arguing with an older, stouter man about their foolish 14-year-old sister. The older one blames their mother's influence on how she has turned out rather than his desire to send her to a boarding school during turbulent times, as the younger believes. The older one doesn't understand the younger's need to rescue a girl hell-bent on rebellion, especially since they've only met twice. (laughs) The younger man, better known as Sherlock Holmes, (laughs) has a plan and doesn't need Mycroft's assistance. (laughs) Oh, it's already happened. I'm I'm not sorry about it. No, please don't be. (laughs) At the office of Dr. Leslie T. Rogoston, PhD, scientific perditorian, Dr. John Watson, MD, presents his card. Enola Holmes, or rather Miss Ivy Meschel, when in the office, knows that name. It's her brother Sherlock's closest acquaintance. What is he doing here? Mm. Jodper, the page boy with the sadly misspelled name, and yes, who was named after the riding breeches, doesn't know obviously. Well, Miss Meschel can't leave the good doctor waiting. With reluctance, Dr. Watson informs Miss Meschel that he is here on behalf of his friend Sherlock, who is unaware of his visit. Dr. Watson has seen a disturbing change in his friend of late. He seems distraught. After speaking to Sherlock's brother Mycroft, they found out that the Holmes brothers' mother and sister have gone missing in fear their sister is alone in London disguised as a boy. Dr. Watson wants to engage Dr. Augustine's services to help locate her. Well, it seems Enola's first case is to find herself. <laughs> it's done. Sh- Yay! Way to go! Cash that check. Case closed. <laughs> oh, please add a favourable review out of five stars. <laughs> Oh, it's a shame she can't take the case. But she doesn't want to be found and forced into the genteel life of a young lady her brothers seem insistent upon. Miss Meschel asks why Mr. Holmes does not make the inquiry himself, and Dr. Watson informs her that Sherlock doesn't normally take such cases, finding them generally mundane. Why... Just the other day, Sir Eustace Alistair and Lady Alistair's daughter was reported missing, yet Sherlock was unmoved to offer assistance. This is interesting. Very interesting. This is a case Enola can take on. With this upsetting news about Sherlock, Enola wishes she could consult her mum. However, they only communicate via encrypted flower messages posted in the paper. That night, having stripped the guise of Ivy Meschel, Enola pens a message to her mother in a very clever way to ask her to meet at London Bridge. Hopefully, the changes in the flower code would help stress the importance of the message. Once done, Enola dresses for her nighttime life with weapons, items to give to the poor, and a black veil. Mm. 
The night is wet and freezing as Enola wanders the streets, listening for crying. She finds someone huddled. She could be a widow or a spinster, but it doesn't matter, for she needs help. Enola gives the woman stockings, a blanket, a portable fire, a meat pie, and some coins. All the while, the woman tells her, Thank you, sister. Thank you. Thank you, sister. Thank you. There are too many people like this. As Enola walks on, she hears the sounds of a public house, which is odd. It distracts her long enough for someone to wrap something around her neck and tighten. Enola is sure she will die. When Enola comes to, it is to blurry figures in her vision, questioning why someone would attack a nun. Though still feeling the effects of the attack, Enola hurries back to her lodging house and starts to claw at her clothing desperately needing air. Around her neck, she finds the garrote fashioned from some white cord knotted to a stick of wood. The only reason she's alive is thanks to the high collar stiffened with whalebone and the drunkards happening by. Examining the device, Enola notes the cord is from the lacing of a lady's stair, and the wood is finely crafted cane. She flings the garrote into the fire. That is terrifying, by the way. It that is. entire thing. Yes, it was so scary. Yeah. Enola takes to her bed. Her throat is bruised and sore, but it's more her pride that has been prickled and the evil of the incident that bothers her. The parts used to make the garrote symbolize all that she ran away from. So many questions go through Enola's mind over the three days she stays in her lodging house. Sitting in the office, Enola berates herself for feeling lonely. She needs to do something and remembers Sir Alistair's missing daughter. But first, tea. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> no. <laughs> Heading down to the warm kitchen, Enola listens as the cook regales her and the housekeeper about the mesmerist she saw the night before. Stuff and nonsense. <laughs> the conversation moves on to gossip, and since household staff see and hear everything, they are veritable fountains of knowledge, which Enola will tap about Sir Alastair's missing daughter. Sir Alastair is only a baronet, and has been disgraced. His daughter, Lady Cecily, had an affair. <gasps> a ladder was found outside her bedroom window. <gasps> <gasps> Shocking. Shame. Cecily had been very improperly corresponding with a shopkeeper's boy with ideas above his station. However, Cecily wasn't found with him. Enola retires to Dr. Rogoston's room, where she has her disguises hidden in a secret room behind the bookcase. We all want one. I know, so much. Especially <laughs> one full of costumes? Hello? <laughs> it's my dream. <laughs> Eventually, Enola emerges as a gentlewoman in a grey dowdy dress with her hair up and a knife secreted about her person. As Mrs. Rug Austin, Enola makes a quiet exit from the office, hails a cab, and, sketching on the way, alights on a fashionable street in the house of Sir Alistair. She plays the part of the upper-class lady and is admitted inside to at least warm herself by the fire, if not to see Lady Theodora. Thankfully, the butler comes back and escorts her to Lady Theodora's boudoir. Ooh, that's sexy. A boudoir. <laughs> Addressing the delicate topic of Lady Cecily's disappearance, Lady Theodora seems grateful to Dr. Rogoston for forcing their acquaintance in the opportunity to use his services. However, Mrs. Rogoston offers to look over Lady Cecily's rooms. As young ladies of a similar age, something may stand out to her. After tea, Enola looks over Lady Cecily's rooms. She notes Lady Cecily either neglected typical ladylike pursuits or was just dreadful at them. Interrogating the maid as she examines the chamber, Enola finds out that Lady Cecily disappeared in her nightdress and her window was already ajar an inch, which was typical as it was believed that ventilation strengthened the moral resolve of one's digestion and so forth against disease and guarded one's personage against laxness. <laughs> 1800 bullshit, in other words. <laughs> 
She also learns that all correspondence was given to the police already. And thank you very much. They were not received through the post. Shocking. But likely a servant helped deliver that. Mm. Interestingly, Enola finds Lady Cecily's journals written backwards and requiring a mirror to read. Enola notes the journals hardly contain the sentiments one would write if one was planning an elopement with a secret lover. Another interesting find are the large quantities of used charcoal sticks, but no hint of black in any of the art. The maid claims to know nothing, but that doesn't stop Enola finding Cecily's hidden artworks. They depict the harsh reality of people from the poorest streets of London. Enola is sure Lady Cecily did not run off for love, but something else that is likely to do with her charcoal drawings. After once again transforming into Ivy Meshel, Enola returns back to her lodgings to read Lady Cecily's journals, which display her indignation at the treatment and lack of aid to the poor. In the office, Enola starts sketching Lady Cecily over and over again, until Jodper interrupts with tea. He takes a look at the sketches and declares that he knows the lady Enola is drawing. Really? Unfortunately, Jodper isn't able to give much information, just something about her having a basket of papers. Well, that was a useless and frustrating conversation. <laughs> Enola decides to go shopping at Ebenezer Finch and Sons Emporium, not the usual shopping establishment, more an ocular extravaganza. Enola isn't interested in the merchandise, however, rather the and son, the shopkeeper who had been corresponding with Lady Cecily. Enola is able to find Alexander Finch quickly. His father, Ebenezer, berating him was a good signpost. Catching his attention, Enola is able to speak with him under the ruse of purchasing shoes. Enola notes that under Alexander's bland exterior, he has intelligence and less definable qualities. Then his expression changes and he tells Enola he believes they have met before, though she hasn't introduced herself with any of her names. Alexander reveals very liberal thoughts on class and societal norms that he shared with Lady Cecily. Their meeting was pure happenstance when he stopped to help her with a flat bicycle tire, but soon he would take Lady Cecily to see the proletariat which she would sketch. It's of Alexander's belief that Lady Cecily strolled out the front door and put the ladder at her bedroom window herself. This was also a really creepy scene. Oh, he's a He creepy, is creepy, creepy a creep, but just, uh, you can see it click in his head while he's lacing up the boots, and then he's like... Tightening them. He's, yes, he's just... It's creepy. Yeah. Like, no, I'll put my own boots on, thanks. Yeah, mm, mm, mm. Um, I'm going to use buttons around this guy. I'm going to button up my cool. boots. Velcro, it's quicker. Than you can Velcro. Get away. And also, it's a vampire's best friend. Yes. We all know how we appreciate that. Yes. <laughs> On the way to her lodgings, Enola picks up a copy of Marx's book, Das Kapital, which she learned Alexander and Lady Cecily so revered. After reading some that evening, Enola can't figure out for the life of her how it converted Lady Cecily and drove her to run away. As Enola ponders this over tea the next morning, being left with more questions than answers, she spots a series of numbers in the paper that look to be a response from her mother. Wonderful! Oh, devastating. Enola and her mother have a complicated relationship, meaning she both wants to see her and desperately doesn't. As Enola looks at the message, doubt creeps in. Her mother requests to meet at the British Museum. The British Museum? No, that can't be right. There were no mentions of flowers and she would never choose a British Museum as a meeting point, denouncing it as an insult to female scholars. This can only mean one thing. The message was sent by Sherlock. Deciding what she must do, Enola visits Dr. Watson that afternoon as Miss Meshel. Enola asks Dr. Watson if Sherlock looks for ciphers in the newspaper, which of course he does, but he also mentions a lady's little book of ciphers describing the language of flowers on his desk. Oh no, 
Sherlock must have gotten it from Inspector Lestrade after it was stolen from her by a cutthroat. See book one and our episode for all the details. He's been spying on her communications with their mother, and this meeting is a trap. When Enola leaves Dr. Watson's office, she takes a cab to Baker Street, removing as much of Ivy Meshel as she can. Lingering in the cold outside her brother's lodging, Enola speaks to a street vendor, buys the girl's entire stock at a marked-up price, and trades coats with her. In a new disguise, Enola strolls up and down Baker Street until Sherlock emerges, disguised as a common labourer. Enola hopes she is right and their mum isn't walking into Sherlock's trap as she knocks on the door of 221B Baker Street. The housekeeper, Mrs. Hudson, opens the door. With some drama, Enola is admitted into the house and permitted to wait for Mr. Holmes. I love that her drama includes sniffing an onion until she cries. (laughs) (laughs) Mrs. Hudson leaves Enola in Sherlock's rooms to get tea. Noting the mess of her brother's lodgings, Enola gets to work, searching until she finds the book of ciphers. Just in time, too, as Mrs. Hudson returns with tea and walnut cake. Then she takes a seat to join Enola. (laughs) Not good. Thinking quickly, Enola asks to use the water closet, sending Mrs. Hudson off to check the state of the facilities, which gives Enola the opportunity to dart out the front door and into a cab to the British Museum. I love Mrs. Hudson's absolute, like, crazy. Oh my god, she needs to use the toilet. Oh, Oh, how embarrassing. (laughs) Not the toilet. From the cab, Enola soon spots Sherlock waiting outside the museum and no sign of their mum. Thank goodness. (laughs) She directs the driver to her own lodgings where she looks over the cipher book, spotting Sherlock's lightly written notes to the clues she had already solved and a few she did not. Instead of removing them, Enola takes her time to look over her brother's handwriting, thinking how handwriting can tell a lot about a person. These musings wander to Lady Cecily's journals, how dramatically different handwriting could be, how Lady Cecily had her inkwell placed on the left side of her desk. Then suddenly, Enola realises something. No! Gasp. The following morning, Enola is rudely awakened by her landlady calling her to breakfast. In a sullen mood, Miss Meshel makes her way to the office to look through the newspapers for replies from her mum, unfortunately to no avail. Turning her attention to Lady Cecily's disappearance, Enola spends hours making sketch after sketch of Lady Cecily in different hats, hairstyles, and garments. Eventually, calling for Jodhpur to add more coal to the fire, Enola lets the lad look over the various sketches she's laid out across her desk. His eyes catch on one, and Jodhpur admits he saw her within the last week wearing a rag around her head. It seems Lady Cecily has gone from observing the poor to becoming one of them. Ooh. Dressed again as Mrs. Vagostin, Enola examines the Alastair residence. Lady Cecily's bedroom was a considerable height upward, needing a very conspicuous ladder, like the one Enola finds in the carriage house, which is far too big and far too heavy for one young lady to extract, carry and lean against the house. Visiting Theodora, Enola notes she is dressed as if in mourning for her daughter already. Mrs. Rogoston confines that she was sent by her husband to ask a question of some delicacy regarding the case. (sighs) Was Lady Cecily left-handed? No, <gasps> the shame! Shame! <gasps> it's disgusting. After some <sighs> obvious outrage and uh, dis- it's the disparaging accusation, terrible, terrible accusation, oh. Lady Theodora admits the nanny and governess may have reported some early incidents of her daughter's youth, but... There is most assuredly not going on still. She is not left-handed. The disgust! (gasps) (laughs) Is becoming convinced that there are in fact two Lady Cecilies. One who paints pastel pictures with her right hand and sketches that stark reality of the gutter in charcoal 
with her left. No! <sighs> Sitting down that night, Enola decides to use logic to reason through the why and how of Lady Cecily's disappearance. Unfortunately, logic has turned to chaos, and nothing makes sense. Donning her disguise of the sister, Enola goes into the night to do what she can for the poor. The terror of her last outing plays on her mind as she heads to the workhouse laden with supplies. Surprisingly, Enola finds there is a considerable fire already burning, surrounded by a group of women and a craggy-looking older gentleman with a long gray beard warming themselves. After one of the women finishes a story, Enola starts giving out the food she brought, and the old man, with a cockney accent, mentions he is looking for his 14-year-old granddaughter, Ivy, lost to the streets, last seen wearing a coat not unlike the one the woman is wearing. Thrusting a meat pie and cheese at him, Enola gazes at her brother Sherlock, thankful that her veil hides her identity. I love that scene. scene too. I love that one too. It's so funny. I like to think she's just going <laughs> behind the veil. The next day, Enola, as Ivy Meshel, heads to the office, safe in the knowledge that Sherlock does not know where she is. Scanning the papers, there are still no messages from her mother. Enola turns to her sketches and lets her mind wander. She draws various people, but it's the face of Ebenezer Finch and the scowl she gave him that makes her pause. The other day, Mr Finch all but accused his son of being an anarchist, not something Enola was overly familiar with. Dressing as gentry, Enola heads back to Finch's Emporium. Upon her arrival, she asks the first clerk she sees to fetch Master Alexander Finch. Waiting for him, Enola wonders why the clerk seems so nervous at her request. Then her mind wanders to the previous visit to the Emporium, and Master Finch taking her all the way to the shoe department, and his aptitude at pulling the laces tight, when suddenly Enola becomes faint. Master Finch's face was familiar, as she recalls the man who tried to garrot her, who had seen her face under her veil. Feigning a faint, the clerks take her to their break room and she listens to their conversation about dock workers and strikes. But then Mr Finch interrupts them to see why they're not working. And Enola takes her leave. Terrifying. Yeah. Imagine if he walked in at that point. Ooh. <sighs> that night, dressed in her nun garb, Enola returns to Finch's Emporium this time to the rear to survey the architecture and work out how Alexander Finch may have descended from the clerk's quarters on the top floor. Once established, Enola settles in to wait, and her patience pays off. Finch, dressed as a day laborer, heads into northwest London, Enola following. Eventually, Finch leads her to a doss house where the poorest of the poor stay, but rather than going inside, he slips down an alleyway and returns a few minutes later in disguise before knocking on the doss house door. If Enola hadn't sketched her likeness countless times, she wouldn't have recognized the gaunt and ragged Lady Cecily. Finch does some strange hand movements which seem to place her under a spell, and he tells her, work first food afterward, before turning and heading towards St. Paddington Station, Lady Cecily behind, and Enola following them. Outside a public house, Finch stops at a group of rough-looking men with Lady Cecily remaining behind a short distance. Finch then stands on a crate and begins an anarchist speech, the likes of which Mr. Finch complained loudly about. After, he approaches Lady Cecily and signals for her to start giving out pamphlets. Enola approaches Lady Cecily and whispers her name, but she does not respond, not even a twitch. Enola realises she must be mesmerised. Finch has placed Lady Cecily in a trance and is controlling her. But what should she do? Meek and mild, though Lady Cecily may appear, if Enola tried to do anything, it could result in disaster. However, Enola notices that the mesmerized Lady Cecily is using her right hand. So, if she could make contact with her left hand, maybe the forthright left-handed lady would break the mesmeric hold. 
Instinct takes over Enola, and using one of the pamphlets, she begins to sketch Lady Cecily, then switches to her left hand and starts mirror writing, when Lady Cecily snatches at her hand, demanding to know who she is. Enola lifts her veil and offers to take Lady Cecily to clean up and get some food. Together, they take a few steps before Lady Cecily stops and tells Enola that she can't walk away from the cause and Cameron Shaw, indicating the disguised Alexander Finch. Enola manages to get Lady Cecily away and asks about Cameron Shaw as they wander the unfamiliar streets. Lady Cecily had dreamt about him, standing over her bed and telling her she had been chosen for his cause. Creepy A F. So creepy. Yikes. When she woke, there were clothes laid out for her and a ladder to climb down, placed under her window and Cameron Shaw was at the bottom. Before that night, she had never met him. And all recognises the truth that Alexander Finch as Cameron Shaw had tricked and mesmerised Lady Cecily. Suddenly, Lady Cecily declares she must be getting back. And all that tells her she has a home with her family, but Lady Cecily doesn't want to go back to the place she was so stifled. And all that tells her there are other possibilities, thinking that she may have found a kindred spirit, if not a potential sister, with Lady Cecily. Suddenly, Cameron Shaw intervenes, shouting for Cecily. Lady Cecily walks away and toward Cameron Shaw, who bends down and berates her. Enola looks for an opportunity, and when she sees it, dashes out, grabbing the fake beard and wig, revealing Alexander Finch. Lady Cecily is outraged, and the spell he has over her is broken. Finch grows angrier and refuses to let Lady Cecily walk away from him. He reaches for a garrot, and Enola makes another dash at him, but he punches her. Then, Finch brings his hands back and wraps the garrot around Lady Cecily's neck. Enola sees red and raises her dagger, stabbing his arm, and keeps stabbing even after Finch has fled. Turning to Lady Cecily, she peels the embedded garrot from her neck, gathers her up, and runs toward Dr. Watson's office close by. Inside is Dr. Watson with his dinner companion, Sherlock Holmes. Oh, dang it. (laughs) Dr. Watson grabs Lady Cecily and begins administering to her, Sherlock watching on and pointing out that this is no beggar girl and that clearly she is a gently bred lady in disguise. Sherlock turns to Enola, whose veil is hiding her face, demanding answers. When Enola speaks, Sherlock recognises his sister and tries to reason with her. But unfortunately for Sherlock, his reasoning is flawed, as he does not know his sister well and that she wants her freedom rather than the usual wants of a lady. Enola tells her brother she is quite well and does not need to worry about her. Then, using the arrival of the constabulary to his distraction, Enola flees. She goes to the one place Sherlock would never look, and which has added a bonus of readily available disguises. 221B, Baker Street. (laughs) 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 Hours later, Sherlock Holmes returns to 221B, Baker Street, and finds evidence of his sister spending the night, and proof that she has once again outwitted him. (laughs) Meanwhile, Enola sends a coded message to her mother advising all is well, though the office of Dr. Rogostin, scientific predatorian, is closed until further notice. In the agony columns of several papers, the message to E.H., please be reasonable, amnesty promised on our family honor, no questions asked, please contact S.H. and M.H. Enola's reply is simply... Rot. (laughs) In the Paul Ball personal column, however, Enola receives a response from her mother. Fidelity, not a clinging vine, I knew you would stand tall. In other words, her mother knew she would do quite well on her own. Though not all is truly well for Enola, it will be, someday, as she will attend to it. The end. Mysterious question mark appears. (laughs) I can't think of any appropriate segue other than listen to this promo. (laughs) Sure. 
Yeah. We'll disguise ourselves for 20 to 30 seconds as another podcast. Woo! (laughs) What's up, fellow book nerds? It's time to feed your fiction shelf addiction. Hear book club style roundtables, bookish chats, and more. Join Tamara and her friends for fantasy and thriller read-alongs and other shenanigans over on the Shelf Addiction Podcast. Listen now on your podcatcher of choice. Subscribe for free and you too can have a shelf addiction. (laughs) Wow, that was terrible. That was. It was awful. It's fine. Whatever. (laughs) Oh, dear me. So. Second Enola mystery. Yes. Did you enjoy it more than the first one? Because the first one was fun. I did. I did like this one a little bit more. I I like Enola on her own. I love all of her costumes. Mm. And that she wears nostril stretchers and cheek enhancers. And the cheek enhancers are actually for something else. Which, I mean, how big are her cheeks that she... I mean, is it like some sort of nipple covering or something that she puts in her cheeks to puff them out a little bit? What is it? I need to know. Also, I can't imagine having something inside my nose. But I love it. Sorry, I'm busy trying to do, blow my cheeks up and flare my nose at the same time and see how much it changes my face. <laughs> Just, you know, that, that, that's a visual one for the patreon members i know i really just want to go and get something and show it up my nose don't do that you'll end up in the hospital and have to get something extracted and then it just turns into um total recall when yes yes and then let's get the thing out yes i pull a tracker out of my brain open your mind open your Man, I love Total Recall. <laughs> should we just talk on a Schwarzenegger for five minutes? No, yes, we no, should. stop it, no, stop it, mm-mm. no. Do you no, know what I enjoyed? I enjoyed this one more because it had some really creepy, scary yes. moments. Oh, yes. Like, the grotting was terrifying. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank goodness for whale-borne structures. Alexander Finch... Creepy, 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 creepy. Did not yeah. like him. Mm-mm. You know, he was gross. Just, oh, I can imagine him like putting the shoe on the feet, tying it really tight, and then going. <laughs> yeah, have but a like sniff. I um, I got a slightly like more disgusting vibe from him. Like really enjoying tying those laces oh, yeah. really tight. Oh yeah. Oof. No. Did <sighs> Oof. And do you know the when Cecily is talking about being in her room and Cameron Shaw standing over her bed it makes me concerned. Yeah. Has he done anything else? I know. Ugh. Cause these books I mean it was it's a short book. Yeah. I think it was, what, five hours audio book? Yeah. Yeah, it was a very short one. Um, So they're very short, very snappy, and highly recommend getting the audio books. They're very well read. Yeah. Very enjoyable. Um, And, you know, you, you could listen to it as you're pottering about doing something. You know, you don't have to sit and concentrate on it. But they're fun. They are very fun. And especially if you like uh Gail Carriger books, you're gonna come away thinking Enola is a graduate of Mademoiselle Geraldine's finishing school for young ladies of quality. Definitely. She definitely is. Top marks all around. Um so to have those creepy moments that you didn't get in the first one, it kind of like changed the tone completely of what was a quite a upbeat story. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious. Well, <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, 
I'm curious about the movie. Now, we haven't watched it yet, but we're planning on doing it. But we know that that it's different. It's probably not the same at all, but I'm just I'm curious if if there's anything even remotely close to what happens in the book. Cuz can you imagine how like creeptastic it would be to see someone doing all this lacing and garroting? Uh, uh, uh. From the trailer, I haven't even watched the trailer. I've seen the trailer, but it's a lot of um, Millie Bobby Brown running around. Um, And then Henry Cavill comes on the screen and I kind of zone out. Right, yes. As one does. Yes. Yeah. So. I, um, I really, I really like that there are movies about this series and, um, so I I imagine Millie Bobby Brown as Enola putting on these ridiculous costumes. And of course, Henry Cavill as Sherlock. Yeah. Mm. Very much appreciate that. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I went to my happy place there. Yep. Sorry. Yep. Um, <laughs> So I love all the costumes and the characters that Enola has and how she sneaks around right under Sherlock's nose, especially when she hides in his own room. I adored that bit. It's I absolutely adored that bit. It's just like, it was blowing a raspberry and throwing two fingers up at Sherlock Holmes. Yep. It was fantastic because they were all over the place trying to find her and she's like, hmm... Where's Where the, could I be? The one is this, place? Who is this violin? Who is this syringe for their meth habit? <sighs> mm. I did like that she found his drugs, but didn't outright say what the were. It's a very targeted description. Mm. So if you know, you know. Mm-hmm. But if you're a younger audience member... Doesn't mean anything. Doesn't mean anything. <laughs> <laughs> Mm. I very much appreciated that. Yes. <laughs> I um I like Mrs. Hudson as well. I like Mrs. Yeah. Hudson when she's like, I need to go to the the water closet. It's like, who am I? And then you get this whole historical description of how they weren't the most sanitary places and before anybody used them, you did like to check them just to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought that was fun. It's alright, we know it's eighteen eighty nine. We know sanitary isn't really a thing. It's not a thing. No, no. It did make me wonder though, like all those this bring it back a little bit to those creepy moments and and all uh, being attacked and having all those disguises. Do you think Enola would be able to work out who Jack the Ripper is? Because he's a, he's about at this time. It's mentioned in the stories about the, the Whitechapel killings. So yeah. it was it was alluded to, and I'm like Hello, can we go and find out the answers, please? And all yeah. you can sort this out. Yeah, I think that she would be able to because she's obviously very intelligent and very unassuming. So I think that she would be able to find out some things that other people wouldn't necessarily be able to do. My only worry is that she w- is part of the, you know, demographic. Yeah. But, you know, maybe she's always dressed as a nun. Or what Sherlock and Mycroft thought she was up to, gallivanting around as a boy, getting up to who knows what. Yes. Uh, No. No, no, that's far too theatrical. That's far too obvious. Yeah. (laughs) Scoffing at (laughs) trousers. (laughs) (laughs) It's nice to see Watson this time, though. I don't remember him being in the first one. No, I don't. I don't recall that either. Um, he might have been in, but I. I just. I don't. He wasn't I don't memorable. Think, yeah, I don't think so because there was a lot of. There was a lot of like a description of him in this one, and mm. you know when Enola meets him, she thinks. Oh man, I'd really like to have him as a dad, you know. And I feel like 
that wouldn't have been said in this one if he was mentioned so much in the first one. Yeah, it was very much Mycroft and Sherlock in the first one because there was a lot of travelling from the Holmes estate to London and yeah. not a lot at London, and that's where Watson is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, you, the, this one, like, you're saying about uh, how she's saying, oh, I would like him as a dad. You do, in this one, get a massive sense of how Enola is alone and she doesn't have like a, a sense of self because even in the summary it's like Enola dressed as Mrs. Rogoston, Enola as the nun, Enola as Ivy Meshel and it's like well where's Enola? She gets lost yeah. amongst everything else to the point where I don't even think she herself knows who she is. Yeah. I don't think she does either, but she but she can't be herself. No. Because she has to be hidden. Like for another seven years or something like that. A long yes. period of time. I felt so heartbroken for her when she's talking about Lady Cecily and how they've got the same attitude and they're very similar people and they're of a similar age and she just conjures up this life with living with Lady Cecily being her sister and best friend and having somebody that she could be herself with. And I'm like, it's not going to happen. No, that was so sad. <laughs> yeah, but it's really sad that she just... It's this this dream of hers to have this. And I really got angry at her mum. I was so angry that she's just like, you know what, I've got essentially better things to do than to care for my daughter, yeah. who's 14 year old, and in the world that she wants to change, has absolutely no rights. Yeah. But I'm going to abandon her. Yeah, you know what? I gave her some money. She'll be fine. And it wasn't, she didn't even give her, she, she hid it. Yeah. And like, what if she had, what if Enola had been a little idiot and hadn't been able to find any of that stuff? Well, and then I guess she probably would have just been taken off to boarding school and lived a normal, boring life and would have gotten married and, you know. Be a gentle lady. Be, yes, become a proper lady. Which she would have hated. So She would have hated it. And oh, it's stifling. It's horrible. Yeah. But it just every single time, it's like, i just so angry, so angry with her. Because it's... It's just not right. It's just not right. And no, you, nobody should abandon anybody like that. It's just... I understand that her mum wants to make the world a better place. But you have to weigh those up against what your priorities imminently should be. Yeah. Um, And also... Enola probably could help her. She really Absolutely. could. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. She really could. But, no, Enola, you're perfectly fine on your own. Enola, alone. Enola, alone. <laughs> it's going be so sad. It's awful. It's absolutely awful. Yeah. Alone. Always and forever. You will Enola. do very well on your own, Enola. Enola, you will manage very well on your own, Enola. 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 Alone. Enola. Alone. I obviously didn't care for you when you were born, because I named you Alone. Because you will always be alone. alone. You will grow up alone. alone. You will look after yourself alone. alone. And you will die alone. <laughs> Freaking child mm. abuse from an early age. Yeah, yikes. Right, strong feelings about the mother. Correct. Arr! Other mother, Lady Theodora's outrage at her daughter being left handed. <laughs> no. Was... Oh my god! No! <gasps> Shocking! How dare you! How dare How you! How dare you! It's left handed. Do not speak of this! I cannot take it. Oh! I can I can I point out I disagree with those. My own child is left handed, my father was left handed, and I have some left handed tendencies. Disgusting I, Ah I am the devil's 
child. No. With the devil's spawn. They're all left-handed. <gasps> Mebbies. That explains so much why the priest refused to baptise me. Maybe. <sighs> Maybe. Got Could it. Could be that. Could be that. Yeah, you're disgusting. It's fair. It's fair. <laughs> what? I don't know. Oh. Would you rather <laughs> draw pastels with the right hand or charcoal with the left? No, well, you know, that could very well be one of our questions. Ooh. Ooh. Um, I have a question for you. Was it just was it just me or did it seem like the the mesmerism was like too easy too too good like how how good is this guy at hypnotizing people that he just like Flicks in their face, blows on their nose. He was performing like, some oh. Darren Brown shit right there. And if you don't know who Darren Brown is, look it up because I've seen his live shows and every time I have, he has taken a piece of my soul. He is amazing. He can just flick his fingers and put people under. And But saying that, I found the mesmerism the most unrealistic aspect about the entire story. And I did suspend my belief. And, of course, you know, of course. It was, you do. It was very convenient that the house workers were like, Oh, I went to see a mesmerist last night. It was Oh, all... blimey, it was such a good show. I picked it with my hat pin. <laughs> he told us she was a bridge. Was she cooking like a chicken? Like she go cluck cluck cluck, and then, and then immediately that's the answer to the riddle. That's that solves the case. Oh, she's mesmerized. Stuff and nonsense. Stuff (laughs) and nonsense indeed. No, it was too. It was. It was too convenient. It was rather shoehorned in. Yes, I would have been. I would have been fine with it just being creepy garroter wearing a fake beard, like convincing this woman that she needs to get out of her house and come and join the proletariat. That would have been fine with me. Yes, I agree. For me, the entire story wasn't the case of the left-handed lady. It was the case of Enola trying to make sure Sherlock doesn't find her. Yes. Oh, and by the way, there's a left-handed lady in there. Yes, yes, I agree. I agree with that. And I, I like that story better than the the Lady Cecily aspect. I didn't need to have... I'd say I didn't need to have it in, but I suppose it was necessary. Um, I believe Lady Cecily comes back in other books. I believe she's she is introduced to be a... Possibly to be a friend of Enola. Well, that would make sense because she doesn't want to go back to the Alistair. Enola. Alone. Enola. She doesn't want to go back to her parents. Alone. Yeah. And we don't know what happens to her. Right. I do know that there is a forthcoming book and it's the case of the right-handed something or another and it is Lady Cecily. Oh. Or it might be out by now. I don't know. Okay. I don't actually know how many Lola Holmes books there are. There were six originally, and now she started writing them again. I wonder why. She actually finished... This was something else that I read when I was looking for background information. She actually finished the like the new set, the first of the new one, like a year before the movie came out. So okay. it just was convenient. I'm not going to be the cynical, typically cynical person. I enjoy them, so I'm quite happy to... Yeah, it's fun. ...to have more. Oh. There's eight. There's eight now? There's eight. The last one, book eight, is The Elegant Escapade. Ooh. Ooh, The Black Barouche. Yes. 
And then there's another one coming, the right-handed something or another. That one's not on Goodreads, yeah. Cryptic Finillin. Oh! If we do book five, The Case of the Cryptic Crinoline, you know we have to have Crinoline Lefroy. We do. We will have We will have to invite Peculiar Vigilani Pink Fan. On. Bizarre Banquets. I love the titles. There's one title that I don't love. Mm. Book six. Gypsy Goodbye. Yeah. Mm. There's a lot of gypsy talk. Which I get is 1889, whatever, but... Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, who was your favorite character? Sherlock. <laughs> Same. Without it, I mean, I do enjoy Enola. I do like Enola, but we never really go for the, the, the title character. We try um, not to. Yeah, Sherlock and how he just, like, totally misses his sister. Every single time, she's literally a foot in front of him. Yeah. But he appreciates the fact that she's hoodwinked him. Yes, I do. I do really like that, especially at the end when he's, like, laughing. Because he's like, ah, shit, she was right here. She was right here. Right in my room. She's stolen my stuff. She's gone through my things. Ah, little sisters are the worst. She took my dress. (laughs) <laughs> Confirmed bachelor Sherlock Holmes's lady garments. I love that stealing your brother's dress. <laughs> <laughs> and you know for a fact it's Sherlock Holmes's dress you're stealing. It's gonna be good. I mean, even if it's supposed oh, yeah. to be a doc like a a dos girl a dos lady's outfit. It's still going to be good quality. It's going to it's going it to it's going to be well stitched together. Of course it is. Of course it is. <laughs> <sighs> oh, dear me. Did you have any surprises? Um probably probably Enola not investigating the Alistair house exterior mm. sooner. So, she, you know, she goes there dressed as Mrs. Rogoston mm-hmm. and she does a very thorough investigation of Lady Cecily's chamber, looks at the window, acknowledges the window being open because that's what they do, thinking mm-hmm. it's fresh air. But she doesn't go outside and look up and it felt like very obvious like you you check the inside you check the outside how did the yeah. how did she once at the ground where would you, she have gone yeah yeah and I'm especially a little... townhouses yeah i'm a little surprised by that as well it's like four friggin' stories up how how in the world did she get down from there they are extreme london townhouses like these type of townhouses are very very tall the Look gorgeous houses, but they are very tall. Yeah. So I was very surprised that she didn't do that sooner. Yeah. I'm surprised that Sherlock is so slow. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like Sherlock should be better than this. <laughs> At I think his Sherlock sister. has a very good PR man. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I do I do appreciate though that he went out to a place where he expected her to be dressed as a grizzled old man. Like he knows he knows that she's the nun, right? He's got to know. Especially after no. she puts a meat pie in his face. No, after no. that. No but, no because she's dressed as the nun. When she takes Lady Cecily to, to Dr. Watson, and it's not until she opens her mouth, he goes, Ah, oh, that's my sister. I, but he's got to have some inkling, right? He's got he's to gotta think, hmm. Especially when she shoves a meat pie and a cheese in his face to get him to stop talking. <laughs> Shut up. He's, he's got to think, hmm, interesting. I would like to think so, but he'd be dumb. 
I think the problem is Sherlock is a very intelligent person and he thinks too logically. Mm. Not yes. He doesn't necessarily... If if Enola could disguise her voice enough and she, and you know, the nun spoke, you know, is established that a nun right. never speaks. Right. And she would have gone, call by me, governor. I've seen that Enola. That 14-year-old lass was dressed in joppers and I saw her at the docks I did. He'd probably be like, all right, that's logical. That makes sense. Sure, yeah. That, that fits the narrative I've built in my head of what my sister's doing based on no evidence. That's what I'll follow. Not Enola's sitting comfortably in his... <laughs> in his very own Logics. ladies' clothing. <laughs> ladies' clothing. Probably twiddling with his violin to untune it. Because probably. Because I would do that. She's probably in there fucking shit up. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, completely. Eating his meat pies and cheeses, that. Yeah, of course. That. Of course. His mints. Of course. While he's off at the docks looking for a girl dressed in boys' clothing. Yes. Because that fits his narrative. It does. So he's intelligent, but he doesn't have common sense. Right, yes. Oh, Sherlock. But yeah, you're right, he's slow. <laughs> Oh. Is it time? It's time. It's time. Pew, 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 pew. Can you do a copy? Pew. Pew, governor. Pew, 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 pew. pew, pew. 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 <laughs> we asked on social media, would you rather be a nun or an aristocrat? On Facebook, it won with, nun won was 62%. On Instagram, it was a straight up 50-50. On Twitter, a hundred percent were aristocrats, which I would dispute based on known Twitter. And on TikTok, fifty-seven percent were nuns. We have lots of lovely comments. We do, we do indeed. Bree on Facebook said, "I'll go with none, no matter what sort I picked. The outfit would cover everything, thus hiding more of my identity." Also, odds are it's quicker to change in and out than full aristocratic frappery. I like Ten the word points frappery. For using frappery. Yeah. Yeah. Bonus points for frappery. Yes, yes. Emily on Facebook says this was tough. As much as I would like to dress up in the aristocratic garb, no one would suspect me as much if I was a nun. Vincent on Facebook said, As someone who had a Catholic schooling, I 100% would never trust nuns. There's some evil witchcraft in built in the Wimple that I just can't be having any truck with. <laughs> Colin on Facebook said, Having seen the ancient legend, Nuns on the Run, played out on the screen, I've got to believe that nobody would suspect me of being a fake nun. Please also see Sister Act. Plus, I can pole dance, so I'll fit in perfectly. <laughs> yikes. But I kind of want to see it. But also, yeah. yikes. Yeah. But also, yeah. Yeah. This is where the sexiness has come in. <gasps> Ooh, sexy and pole dancing. Ooh, pole dancing nuns. Ooh. Oh. Ooh. Annie on Facebook said, I'm going with none. And since Constance hasn't done it, I'll be singing How to Solve a Problem Like Maria from The Sound of Music. Nope. Nope. And then Constance came back and she sang it, but I'm not singing it. I refuse to do the homework to, in order to sing it. Please see previous comment, never seen the movie. But I do like the word flibberty gibbet. Oh, yes. But she doesn't included. get the bonus points because it's not her word, it's a copy of lyrics. Yes. Yes, that's true. At Remy on TikTok said, an aristocrat, because people would have more respect for you. And in Eleanor Holmes' case, she'd probably get into places only aristocrats can get into. That is true. It is. L20Kev on Instagram says, none. Ever since I saw... Oh, here it is again. Nuns on the run with Eric Idle and Robbie Coltrane as a kid in the 90s. I've wanted to dress as a nun just so I can say the line from the movie Spectacles, Testicles, Wallet, Watch. I mean, it, is it an episode of Fictional Hangover if we don't say testicles? 
or yes. some some such. Yes, but it's a better episode of Fictional Hangover if you can get spectacles, testicles, wallet, and watch it. That's true. Yeah. Iak underscore Whitaker on Instagram said, Aristocrat, it seems like an interesting life to live. Can I just say the um, comments from your library this week? Chef's kiss, spot on. Every single one of them made they're me very, have a little bit of a giggle. They're very, very good. First comment, snooty McSnoot pants. <laughs> I'd have a great time until I was busted. Champagne, caviar, Wagyu beef. Sign me up. Oh, I love snooty McSnoot pants. Yes. We also have someone who wants to be an aristocrat, another aristocrat, I should say. No one would ever believe I was a nun, like, ever. <laughs> I think my favorite one was nun. Finally, a use for all my Catholic Sunday school knowledge that I had to learn as a child and don't practice now. <laughs> oh, then the last one is nun. I feel like I could pull off pure, innocent, sweet sister Marguerite better than a snooty aristocrat. They would be able to tell pretty quick that I'm basically doing a caricature. <laughs> I want to know who thinks they can be pure, innocent, and sweet. And can they really be pure, innocent, and sweet? Methinks not. No, not at all. No, not at, not, all. Not at all, governor. <laughs> that, yeah, that, that, yeah, that person's in a disguise. So which disguise are you wearing, then? Well, I've already done a nun once and I did some pole dancing too because that's what we did for one of my hen party party things. Party parties. Party party things. <laughs> I was very hungover for that. It's wonderful. There are pictures on my Facebook. If you are Facebook friends with me and you care to look. I'm sorry. I'm not. You sent it to me. I know I did. I saved it. I'm going to blow it up poster sized. But I feel like being an aristocrat. I could pull that off. Yeah, I, I think, think so. Possibly. Think Better so. than the cockney. No, that's all I want all the time. Just all cockney all the time. I want to enunciate. I want to be scandalised at all the left-handed people. Oh! I want to look down <gasps> my nose at the plebs, the proletariat. Oh, the proletariat. Oh, the left-handed I'm, proletariat. I will ride in the brush box. No game post for me. I honestly can't answer this question because I would do both. <laughs> all costumes, all the time. I mean, I feel like my my honest answer is, well, it depends on what job I have from from Mademoiselle Geraldine's right. to complete. What is my um, mission? I feel like my answer would also be it depends. And it depends on if I am a nun. Am I like a haunted nun? Can oh, I be yes. A, can I be a creep nun? Because I'll do that for sure. I, I, I want to be the kind of nun that just basically glides. Yes. Doesn't walk. Right. Yes. Yeah. Creepy nun. Creepy, Creepy nun. nun. All the way. Just hide out in a morgue just to scare people. Yeah, okay. My uncle once, when he was a teenager, his like first job or something like that was working in a morgue. And he said it, it, the, he did the night shift, just like not actually doing anything to the bodies. But he did say it was the creepiest thing and the nuns were the creepiest thing. That's fun. Yeah. I like that. And I'll be probably in the 50s, 60s. That's great. Yeah. Creepy. Next question. Okay. Would you rather wear nostril stretchers or cheek enhancers? <clears throat> nostril stretchers that I may, I may be able to breathe through my nose. Hmm. I feel like if I had cheek enhancers in, I like it would make me want to gag. I'm not very like. I don't know. I feel like it would make me want to gag. So I'll just, I'll shove stuff up my nose. 
I think and it then... depends on the shape of your face as well. Yeah. I think I'm shoving <laughs> stuff up my nose, and then I'll pull it out. Total recall style, like we discussed earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely the way to go. Yeah, definitely. Would you rather be Ivy Meshel or Mrs. Rogoston? I feel like I think I'm gonna pick Ivy Meshel because Mrs. Rogoston, child bride, is very disgusting. <laughs> I don't I don't I don't want to be child bride. I'm gonna be Ivy Meshel. Excellent point. Well made, I agree. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> Would you rather be a scientific perditorian or a mesmerist? Scientific perditorian, and then I can't, because I don't want to be accused of being a creepy AF anarchist. No, see, I want to be a mesmerist because I am imagining like street magicians. <laughs> That's what I want to be. I want to stand out on the street corner doing weird, terrible magic tricks. Because that's the only thing I imagine. I want to make people cluck like a chicken. Yes. I want to be a mesmerist. Once you've mesmerized all these people into believing that they are chickens, then their families can come to me and give me money to then go to the farm where they are currently pecking seed. Sure. And I can go, there you go. And you can click your fingers. Excellent. Mesmerize them. Jobs are good. All right. All right. You've got so a pretty we'll good just... scam going on there. Yeah. Okay. I like it. I like it. Cool. Last question. Mm. Would you rather out sneak Sherlock or Alexander Finch? What's the end result here? You are the lord and master of all that you survey. You tell me your story. Okay, I feel like if we're if we're being fun and having a good time, I'm going to pick Sherlock just for like the shenaniganry of it. Yes, agree. But if it's like life or death, gonna get garroted by a creepy guy who likes to tug strings and look menacingly and longingly at women while he tugs strings, I mean, I want to get the fuck away from that guy. So, life and death, I'm going to get away from Alexander. But shenaniganry, Sherlock. Okay. I, I agree with that answer 100%. Because yikes, that guy. I want to stab him. I'm glad that he no less stabbed that guy. Oh, yes. That was fun. She, she should have stabbed him elsewhere. More. Yeah. Take the stabbings, multiply. Yes, yes, I agree. Yeah. Because yikes, that guy. Oh, yuck. Just yuck. Mm. Yeah. No, no. Do not Mm. like. Do Mm -mm. not like. Mm -mm. Nope. Mm Mm-mm. No. No. All right. Favorite final thought quote? Three for you. I've got three. Okay. I'll give you three. Let's set the scene. Enola likes to curse. She has 19th century potty mouth. Yes. For a gently bred lady. I needed to say something quite naughty. Oh, my stars and garters! (laughs) Scandalous young lady! To which I will also give you the second quote. Confound my genteel upbringing. I could not think of any foul name enough to call him. (laughs) Very good. And I'll leave you with a bit more of a serious one. Okay. Yet one could speak truth and still be a villain. Oh, yes, that's a good one. What are yours? Okay, um... I feel like we would be remiss if we did not say, Enola, you will manage very well on your own. And or, you will do very well on your own, Enola. 
Enola alone. Alone, Enola. Over and over and over again forever. Bloody useless mother. <laughs> um, let's see, what else? To be a man, apparently, was to lack the ability to be a woman. <laughs> <laughs> One order of stating the obvious. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I really want to read this one. <laughs> do it, do it. Girl in a nun's gear, Sergeant says. With a knife, what I hear, and irrational, replied the other. Hard to believe, but they say dangerous. Hysteria, said the other sagely. Common affliction of her sex. I wondered whether that was what Sherlock thought of me. Irrational. Hysterical. Yes, it probably was. <laughs> I can't I can't do a Cockney accent unless it's real high-pitched and weird like that. Gel in a nun's gear. Gel in a... Oh, it's gel, isn't it? Gel in a nun's gear. No, Sergeant but it's a girl. Says. No, but it's a girl. Gel. Can yeah, I... but he's saying girl, so it'd be gal. Gal in a nun's gear. I've heard it you wouldn't, with. You wouldn't say gel if you were speaking of a girl. Gently bred lady. Mm. I've heard of both ways depending on who reads it. Well, if I Wit do and it... a knife, what I hear, and rational, all to believe. As soon as I heard it in the audiobook, I, I bookmarked it. I found it in the ebook. I wrote it down. I was like, she needs to say this. Please let her say this. <laughs> Have you got any others, by the way? No, God, I think that's enough for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, no. We're both hysterical. We're both hysterical. <laughs> The left-handedness of it all. We're being hysterical females. (laughs) Okay, so... If you liked this, try this. Move on. I've moved on already. (laughs) I was struggling to decide between two. Mm, Um, So I'm going to just give you the title to one, but I'm going to give you more detail on the other. Okay. The first one is the the five, the untold lives of the women killed by Jack the Ripper. Jack the Ripper, even. Jack uh, the Ripper. Right, Jack the Ripper. That, that's the pornographic version. It is. The five untold lives of the women killed by Jack the Ripper, on the other hand, by uh, Hayley Rubenhold. Um, I read the, this this year. It's been on my bookshelf for absolute ages. And it's really, really interesting because it doesn't really talk about the Jack the Ripper stories at all. It talks about the lives beforehand. So you find out a lot of historical information on the Doss houses and the pl- what, what what is described as the pl- proletariat mm. in the Enola Holmes books. So if you want some context, historical context, but within a context that you could understand it a bit more, such as the Jack the Ripper stories, I recommend that one. However, because that's factual, um, and it can be a bit heavy, and it's it's not um graphic, but it can have moments where you just your heart bleeds for them. It really mm-hmm. does. Uh, I'm going to give you uh another. I'm going to give you a, a, a fiction. Um, uh, is the, is it sexy? It's it it's not. Unfortunately, <laughs> I kind of wish I had gone for a sexy Sherlock Holmes story now, especially because this month I've gone for this month's theme. Which mm. is, you know, Twisted Tales. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. I've gone for another one where they take the Sherlock Holmes on its turn on its head. And I haven't read it, but again, it was kind of like linking to the fact that it's the Jack the Ripper stories, which is mentioned in Anola. You know, we talked about it earlier. Right, Couldn't yes. Anola solve the, the Jack the Rippers? So it is going on in the background. And this one is actually just called, it's called Dust and Shadows, an account of the Ripper killings by John H. Watson. And it's written by Lindsay Fair. And the reason I picked it was because of the Jack the Ripper thing, but because mm-hmm. it kind of twists what's going on uh, and it puts Sherlock in a different 
uh, context. So the summary from Goodreads. In Dust and Shadow, Sherlock Holmes hunts down Jack the Ripper with impeccably accurate historical detail, rooting the Whitechapel investigation in the fledgling days of tabloid journalism and clinical psychology. This astonishing debut explores the terrifying prospect of hunting down one of the world's first serial killers without advantage of modern forensics or profiling. Sherlock's desire to stop the killer who was terrifying the East End of London is unwavering from the start, and in an effort to do so, he hires an unfortunate known as Mary Ann Monk, the friend of a fellow streetwalker who was one of the Ripper's earliest victims. However, when Holmes himself is wounded in Whitechapel attempting to catch the villain and a series of articles in the popular press question his role in the crimes, he must use all his resources to, in the desperate race to find the man known as The Knife before it's too late. Penned as a pistache by the loyal and courageous Dr Watson, Dustin Shadow recalls the ideals evinced by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's most beloved and most renowned characters while testing the limits of their strength in a fight to protect the women of London, Scotland Yard and the peace of the city itself. Ooh. It's not going to be all lightness and heart and right. funny and all the homes. Right. But it's a twist on the stories. I like it. Cool. What have you got? Well, I have been recommended this one by multiple people. And it's also been suggested that we cover this on the podcast, so I figured I might as well talk about it now so we can get it into our heads. This one is called A Study in Charlotte by Brittany Cavallaro. I've looked at this summary so many times, especially because people are like, you have to read this, Amanda. You have to read this. You have to read this. You have to talk about this on the podcast. So, I mean, we really we really just need to do it. I am on the document with our list, and I'm putting it underneath books to read. Fantastic. There, it's done. The last thing Jamie Watson wants is a rugby scholarship to Sheringford, a Connecticut prep school just an hour away from his estranged father. But that's not the only complication. Sheringford is also home to Charlotte Holmes, the famous detective's great-great-great-granddaughter, who has inherited not only Sherlock's genius, but also his volatile temperament. From everything Jamie has heard about Charlotte, it seems safer to admire her from afar. From the moment they meet, there's a tense energy between them, and they seem more destined to be rivals than anything else. But when a Sheringford student dies under suspicious circumstances, ripped straight from the most terrifying of the Sherlock Holmes stories, Jamie can no longer afford to keep his distance. Jamie and Charlotte are being framed for murder, and only Charlotte can clear their names. But danger is mounting, and nowhere is safe, and the only people they can trust are each other. That sounds amazing. Sounds to me like a boarding school with murder. That's what I was thinking. Mm, and we perhaps have a theme for 2023 that fits this perfectly. Perhaps we have a book for August. Mm. All right, Governor. All right, then. Do we have a recommendation for Spotlight this week? <laughs> we do. Let's stop this voice because it's getting irritating. <laughs> okay, so... Andy Spotlight for this for this episode is called Agatha Anxious and the Deer Island Ghost by R. J. McDowell and illustrated by Diana Whitney. The dead don't talk. Or do they? On her thirteenth birthday, Agatha Anxious is assigned her first ghost. Now her Aunt Hattie has vanished. A pirate coin, strange messages drawn by a skeleton hand, and a chance book report provide clues to unraveling the mystery. One which requires a midnight trip to a funeral home and a secret mission to a haunted Mardi Gras mask shop. An evil from the past has surfaced in Biloxi. Can Agatha use her newfound gifts to save her aunt? Or will she be the next victim of an old ghost with a grudge? Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Sounds like fun, even if I don't know how to read. I don't think either of us do this week. Nah. 
<laughs> it's no. not our best attempt. It's fine. To be fair, this is like this is episode fifty one <laughs> of the year. We're allowed to, we're allowed we're allowed. We're allowed. We are allowed. <laughs> All right. Uh. So that's it for this episode of Fictional Hangover. I'm Amanda. And I'm Claire. Join us next time for our last episode of the year <gasps> and the last book in the Sookie Stackhouse series, Dead Ever After by Charlene Harris. Look out for our Would You Rather polls on social media. Don't forget about our book club and monthly challenges on Facebook. Be sure to visit our shop on Redbubble at fictionalhangover.redbubble.com for all your favorite fictional hangover-themed merchandise and become a patron of ours on Patreon at patreon.com slash fictionalhangover. It's almost time for our changes to take effect. Oh, I'm so excited. Almost time. Almost time. I know what they are. Until next time, remember, the only cure for a fictional hangover is another book. <laughs> Shut it down. Shut it down. Shut it down. You can find us at fictionalhangover.com. Follow us on Instagram at fictionalhangover. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash fictionalhangover. And on Twitter at fictionalhangover, no E-R. If you like this episode, check out our others and be sure to rate, review and subscribe so you don't miss out. And finally, special thanks to Liz Emerson for her music. You can find her on Facebook and Patreon. Thanks for listening. <laughs>